we're going to do now is uh, three experts in the general fields of childhood leukemia, solid tumours and brain tumours have taken on the challenge of giving you a kind of state of the art, where are we now? And where is the research going in the future at the moment and what are the key unanswered challenges? I've asked each speaker to prepare 10 minutes talk so we've got some time for questions after each talk. But then we're also going to have some breakout groups and plenty of time for discussion in the final session before lunch. Sorry, I forgot my programme. <laughs> Stand first, it's Bruce, isn't it? So Bruce, where are you? Bruce is going to come and give us an overview on the solid tumours, if that's okay. Um, so, uh, I, it, it didn't take me very long to accept um, Angela's invite to come and talk today. Um, as, you, as you heard, I, I had the privilege of, uh, of looking after Bethany when she was uh, diagnosed with a Wilms tumour. And the, the photographs that Angela showed um, always make me giggle because my, my abiding memory of Bethany is no helping us to uh, improve the outcome for patients uh, such as Bethany. Uh, and as Angela said, you know, Bethany is in that small group of patients who really was in a good risk group of categories who shouldn't have misbehaved uh, in the way that she did. Uh, and we sadly was. see um, the current priorities are uh, and, by, and in doing that I'm going to reflect a bit on what we've done in the past because I think there are some important lessons that we all need to learn. So the first question um, to ask is how are we currently doing? Now these survival curves are, are the sort of bread and butter of uh, paediatric oncologists. Every person shows these sorts of slides. This particular slide is some of the most up-to-date data that we've got about cancer survival in children uh, um, and was published um, last year. And what it's showing us is that over the last 30, 40, 50 years, the survival for childhood ca cancer continues to improve. And even in the most recent period of 2006 to 2000. 10, the, the top line there, we've continued to improve the survival uh, for children so that overall survival is now in excess of 80%. So that's a great story in itself, uh, but obviously we're interested in the bit above that line, the children who don't survive. So we've still got some challenges. So what, how did we make those improvements? And I'm going to break this talk down into three um, basic blocks. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do some of the old stuff better. And I think it's important for us to remember that although we've been using the same old chemotherapy drugs for years and years and years and years and years, it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a few percentage points that we can still squeeze out of some of our conventional drugs. So let's not throw away the baby with the bathwater. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we stratify patients, so how we get the right patients into the right groups and give them the right treatment. That's perhaps more about ensuring that the good patients can get less treatment and a little bit about how <coughs> some of the bad actors might need more treatment. And then I'm going to talk a little bit also about how we introduce some new treatments. So let's talk about some of the old stuff that we perhaps are doing better. Um, one of my favourite tumours, osteosarcoma. So this is the same sort of data that you've just seen. We didn't make very much progress in the treatment of osteosarcoma up until perhaps the last um, 10 years or so. And you'll see the, the, the top two lines there. There's been a a, a jump in survival from the 90s, 2000s to the, to the current day. You know, that's quite a significant leap in survival. So the question I have is, how did we do that? 
We know how to stratify osteosarcoma patients. We can tell the bad actors from the good actors using some biology. And in this case, it's how effective the chemotherapy you give up front is at killing your tumor cells. And if you get a good tumor kill, if you kill more than 90% of your tumor, when the surgeons take your tumor out, we know that you have a better outcome. So that's one way that we can use stratification. The problem I think we've got is that for the poor responders, we don't necessarily have better treatment for them to actually improve that survival. And that's been a common theme running internationally for the last 30 years. And I'll show you some data here. Here's some data from the Italian and the Scandinavian group who've been looking at can we give more and more and more chemotherapy to try and salvage those bad actors. And the red um, bit at the bottom is probably one of the most intensive chemotherapy schedules that's been devised for osteosarcoma using very, very industrial doses of chemotherapy. And you can see that really the, the ability to change that um, uh, percentage of patients with a poor response hasn't really been improved by giving more and more and more chemotherapy. That's not the answer. This is a study we did in the United Kingdom. There are two lines here that are identical to each other. These two treatments are chemotherapy given every three weeks versus chemotherapy given every two weeks. So we asked the question, rather than giving more chemotherapy, can you give it more frequently, give more dose intensity? The answer here is it doesn't seem to make a difference. So that doesn't work either. So, We've tried to give more, we've tried to stratify patients, we've tried to give it more frequently, none of that has worked. So what has resulted in that increase in survival of osteosarcoma patients in the UK? It's quite simple. It's a good old-fashioned drug called methotrexate. Because up until the early 2000s, we did not give patients with osteosarcoma methotrexate. Most of the rest of the world did. Since um, the Euromos trial, we did start to give methotrexate. And I think, and I can't see any other data anywhere else, I think good old fashioned methotrexate is the answer. So there's an example of good old fashioned stuff making a difference, even today. What about stratifying patients? I don't know if Nick's going to talk about this, but the, uh, the arch experts at dicing and slicing are the leukemia doctors. But I'm going to talk about um, hepatoblastoma, one of my other loves, a liver tumor. And again, you can see successively over the last um, few years, we've made big strides in survival. The big jump between uh, 1970s, 80s to the 1990s was due to a drug called cisplatin. That made a huge difference to these patients. Don't want you to take in any of the detail of this slide, only that this is where we are going with hepatoblastoma in terms of trying to stratify the patients into good risk groups, high risk groups, very high risk groups. And we're starting to use a whole number of different um, parameters. We're using age, we're using how extensive the tumour is, we're using how much the tumour has spread, we're using biochemical markers like uh, alpha -feta protein, which is a, a, a blood marker which is secreted by these tumours. And so this risk stratification becomes more and more and more complicated. But it does help us to decide which group of patients need what, which treatment. <coughs> this is the survival of patients with standard risk hepatoblastoma. It's absolutely superb. And this was a study that we did a number of years ago which showed that actually you can just give these patients one drug, not two drugs. So if you take away the doxorubicin, just give cisplatin to these children, you can uh, still uh, achieve 95% <coughs> cure rates. 95%. That's great, but there's still a 5%. And wouldn't it be nice to know why those 5% didn't do well? And that's probably back to the original question that we had, biology. For these patients, we've also got another important question, and that's around toxicity. So cisplatin, one of the uh, side effects of cisplatin is hearing loss, deafness. 
95% of these children are being cured, but a significant number of them are being cured with some significant hearing loss. Wouldn't it be nice to try and avoid that? So again, we're looking at the biology to see why some patients are at more risk of developing hearing loss. We're trying to reduce the amount of cisplatin that these patients get exposed to. And we're also introducing new drugs which may prevent the hearing loss. Let's talk about new drugs. I'll be testing you on this later, so please pay attention. Um, this, is, this is one of the cancer pathways, okay? This is a pathway called ALK. It's one of the pathways which drives cells to replicate and become cancerous. It all starts at the top there with those blue squiggly things, a receptor that sits on the top of the cell. And in a lot of adult cancers, these receptors get mutated, genetically mutated, and they get mutated so that they're constantly sending messages down into the cell to make them divide, make them divide, make them divide. So mutation of receptors in adult cancer practice is a very, very big player, and there's a lot of research going on in that field. For paediatrics, mutation of receptors is not nearly such a big deal. And yet, we still know that these complicated pathways that are driving the cell to become cancerous are important and are a trigger for a proportion of patients. And the reason, the reason we know that is data like this, which basically shows you that in neuroblastoma cells, that ALK pathway is being activated. And if you look at patients who have overexpression of ALK in the blue line, they don't do as well. And we know from other experiments that we do is if you can inhibit the ALK pathway, you can cure tumours. And that's resulted in this drug called chrysotinib. Uh, chrysotinib is an inhibitor of that ALK pathway. It's one of these novel, new targeted agents we're all hearing about. There have been some absolutely spectacular results with this drug mainly in a condition called large cell anaplastic lymphoma, a rare form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But the response rates to this drug are absolutely stunning. But it's one of a very, very, very few number of drugs which are showing this sort of exciting result in children. But we need to do more to find out why these pathways are being activated and how we can inhibit them. So it's all about biology. Today, I think, particularly, is all about biology and about doing the old stuff better. The bi there's still some biological, biology questions that we need to ask about the old stuff. Surprisingly, we don't know how children tolerate some of our good old-fashioned conventional chemotherapy drugs. Um, and, as I've said, biology can help us and will help us understand why some tumours behave differently to our conventional chemotherapy. Why does one hepatoblastoma seem to respond very well to cisplatin and others don't. Biology will increasingly be used, and certainly in the leukemia world, is being increasingly used to help us stratify those patients into the good players and the bad players. And it will help us um, to pick out the, the, the good player who behaves badly. Now the difficulty there is that we still need to find a new treatment for that patient, but hopefully uh, that will come along with it. I've talked about toxicity, and there is biology to be asked about toxicity in the good players. Do we understand why some patients are more sensitive to our chemotherapy drugs? And as I say at the bottom, unfortunately, just because you're a bad actor, and we know that you're a bad actor, it doesn't necessarily mean we've got better treatment for you yet. And then introducing new treatments, I've shown you the example of, uh, of ALK, and that uh, is one example of how doing a lot of the molecular work that is done helps us to identify potential targets which we can then utilise drug therapy against. I think we have to bear in mind that, as I've said to you, that the signalling of the pathway is different between adults and children. Most of the drugs, really all of the drugs that we're getting into children, have been tested in adults in a pathway that may be the same, but in an activation 
is perhaps rad radically different. So some of our drugs that we're testing in children may not show the same effects as we're showing in adults, and that's both ways. Some relatively ineffective drugs in adults actually might be big, big players in paediatrics, and that's a big frustration for us. Um, and we have to recognize that, that the, these molecular signals may change during treatment. So the molecular signal at diagnosis is probably different to that at relapse and during treatment. And again, the leukemia docs have got a lot of uh, experience in this. And that brings up some ethical challenges for our patients in terms of it would be nice to perhaps biopsy tumors at regular intervals during the pathway. I'm not going to talk about immune therapy, but I think this is coming around the corner very quickly and there are some big, big developments coming around the corner in using the body's own immune system to fight cancer. Quick plug for import, you've heard a bit about the biology of Wilma's tumour. This is doing what it says on the tin. This is all about biology, so this is identifying good, good actors, the bad actors, trying to understand why they are good or bad, trying to find targets uh, that we can uh, put drugs onto to improve the outcome for women's tumour. And this study is now, as we know, up and running uh, with the support of many people around Europe. So finally, this is my final slide, I think we still have to recognise that we've got some big challenges out there. And whilst I've shown you all those great slides of kids who are surviving and more kids who are surviving, we've still got diseases like this, high-grade glioma, where the last 40, 50 years, we've made absolutely no impact at all. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'd like to throw open uh, the floor for a few questions. <clears throat> if anyone's got anything they'd particularly like Bruce to clarify or you want to add something to the perspective that you've spoken about. Yes? James Brown at the University, pretty interesting talk. Speaking as a biologist, I'm trying not to get too biological in the question. Um, uh, in children, I think it's more likely not to be a, a, a single nucleotide polymorphism mutation thing. It's more likely to be a transcriptomic or epigenetic. Are these things being looked at in your P7 trial, in your European trial? Because it's more likely to be a, uh, in an individual the gene may be switched on even if it's not mutated due to the way the body is handling that gene. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think that so the epigenetics is all about how the how the cells actually how, how the DNA talks to itself and helps itself to, to divide. It is a field of research certainly within within the pediatric uh, community. You've you've seen how complex just one pathway was, and I think that's our challenge is that Clearly, there's a lot of crosstalk between these pathways, and although you can say, well, we know that the ALK pathway is being activated, actually the activation of that pathway may be down this pathway or down this pathway. And uh, it's a bit like, for me, it's a bit like chemotherapy you know, resistance and antibiotic resistance to bacteria. You know, the, the, the cells you know, that we're dealing with are canny old things, and, and they can adapt and change their, um, their characteristics as we go through treatment, hence my plea for you know, continued uh, biopsies of patients during treatment. But you're right, you know, this is a hugely, hugely complex field, and it's not just one single genetic event which is going to be the, the answer for, for these patients. <laughs>